Hi, my name is Brian Latimer. This is In Conversation with NBC News Think, a collaborative effort between NBCout.com and NBC News Think. You do a lot. You are millennial in media. Sure, yeah. How do you describe yourself to people who may not know you yet? Um, a lot of times I just say writer because that's what I wanted to be when I was a kid. That's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And then that's what a lot of my stuff has to do with. Um, so I'm just like always I'm looking for writing jobs or writing opportunities or projects. And I'm like, just someone please let me keep keep doing that. The books have been like the things that I'm the most proud of, I think. And um, and so I usually will be like writer. If I'm on like a, a date, I try to I try to not say what I do for as long as possible. So I'm sure I sound like I'm in witness protection because <laughs> it's so hard to explain. Like there's too many. So I'll just be like, yeah, I'm a writer. And then they'll be like, of what? And I'll be like, so what do you do? Yeah, tell me more about you and yeah. I'll about it. Are your parents together? Please stop asking me what I do. So um, I'm going to ask you about what you do. Yeah, no, 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 no that's fine. <laughs> so I'm a reporter, but yeah. you started off in this career and you sort of yeah. segued out of that. And, you know, journalism, you're writing about other people, other things, mm -hmm. but you've created a brand off of yourself. You've talked about your sexuality. Mm -hmm. You've talked about depression, which I find very heartening and impressive. Thanks. How do you build a brand like that? Um, I mean, so, like, as a reporter, I went to school for journalism, and I worked as a reporter for, for a long time when I lived in New York, and, uh, and it was, um, I loved it. I loved, like, telling other people's stories. I loved talking to people. And then what's been cool about the Bad With Money podcast is it feels like hearkening back to reporting. Like, it feels like I'm getting to use those skills to talk to people about their financial situations or learn about money or impart information the way that reporters do, like, about finances and about, um, you know, larger financial systems and the injustices therein. And one thing that was hard for me as a reporter was not injecting your opinion. If I could say, well, the reason I care about this or, you know, the, the, this happened to me and so I want to report on it or the, that kind of stuff that I think was a little bit shat upon uh, in, in that, you know, in like yeah. that kind of. So then I just felt like I couldn't not like a lot of stuff was happening politically where it was like it made sense to be out it made sense like if when mental health comes up in the conversation so often it makes sense to say look I especially like with um the bad with money book which came out in January was the first time I wrote extensively about having bipolar disorder because I was like look that's something that's pretty demonized right they'll say like oh well this happened because this person had bipolar disorder so I was like mm -hmm. well okay then I should put a face to it that isn't um, scary. Hi there. Functioning. Hi, yeah. Have a job. Yeah. I, I have great times and I have tough times too, but yeah. I get through them. Totally, totally. Mostly okay. Uh, and like, well, just the idea that like, you know, oh, they're, they're scary in the sense that they'll hurt someone else or whatever. So uh, that's like a common misconception mm -hmm. with mental health, especially if a few th disorders like bipolar and schizophrenia. So I was like, okay, let me, let me be out about that. So like, I felt like there were a lot of things where it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt me to do it. Like, my family will still love me. I'll still have a job. Everything will be fine. And for a lot of people, that's not true. Like if I have the opportunity to be open about stuff and it won't hurt me in any way, then, like, I should. For, the, for I guess, for the majority of people that, like, can't, you know? Absolutely. And I think that combating that stigma sort of underlies what yeah. you're doing now mm -hmm. by putting yourself out there. One thing that I notice as a queer person in the queer community in sure. New York, there's a lot of non-monogamy. Yeah. I personally am not non-monogamous. I am monogamous. Nice. But I, I, I mean, yeah, it's cool. what works for me. But What's that like? <laughs> lonely at the moment. No, but <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, how do you talk to people about non-monogamy? Uh, not just straight people, but LGBTQ people. Um, it's tough because I, I, I think that there was this. I think there was this thing of, of uh, saying that all bisexuals were a certain way. And then that and then that got some pushback where they were like, there was this other side where people were like, I'm bisexual, but I'm a good person. Okay, but that's also kind of putting this respectability politics or moral, moralistic quality on a sexuality. Like, plenty of, of monosexual people are non-monogamous. Plenty of monosexual people cheat. Plenty of monosexual people, uh, like, you know, are uh, promiscuous or whatever. Uh, but it only somehow gets labeled onto bisexuals. So I, I felt bad for a while being like, I'm bisexual and non-monogamous because I felt like they were two separate identities that people 
mesh together. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I just kind of started doing like this pushback thing of being like, yeah, I'm like a, I like was like, ah, yeah, I'm a evil bisexual stereotype. Uh, I am both evil and bisexual. The two are unrelated. You're saying like, just doing, yeah, like debilitating to your yeah. own personality to justify it mm-hmm. almost to people. Like trying to be like, oh no, I'm not a good role model as the, as I, what I actually am. Like mm-hmm. I am, like I can't not be what, and then I felt like a lot of bisexuals felt similarly, like pushed aside or sort of like, no, 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 hush, 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 you're the bad ones, you know, by this thing of like, please let us into the community and let us be respected. We're good bisexuals, you know? And so um, I think monogamy was part of that, was like, we have to say, we're bisexual, but we have to be like, no, 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 but we're monogamous. And it's like, I started kind of resenting that and then I started sort of being like, I don't know, sorry, I'm a lot of fun. Like, I don't know what you want. Am I supposed to not enjoy the, the things that I enjoy or be the way that I am because I want, I want respect from largely straight people. Uh, and so, I mean, I I have a hard time understanding monogamous people, truly. Like I, And I have a hard time understanding monosexual people because uh, I don't know. I just, it's, I, it's out, outside my experience. But I trust, I'm like, uh, congrats on your monogamy. I hope yeah. that works for you. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, the, what else e- can you say? Yeah, equal relationships work out or don't work out. Relationships that are, people are like, polyamorous relationships don't work. And I'm like, neither do monogamous relationships. I feel that. I feel that very much. Mm-hmm. And So I guess to, to go a little bit deeper onto it, sure. are you trying to cleave a space between bisexual and non-monogamous? Yeah. Or are you trying to bring them together and say it's okay to be both? It is okay to be both. They are two separate things, two completely separate identities. And you can be bisexual and monogamous. You can be non-monogamous and, and be monosexual or be gay or be straight or whatever. But like... Yeah, they're two completely separate identities, which I think happens a lot where people confuse even, like, gender and sexuality, where they're all, you know, like, there was that whole thing with Mario Lopez where he was like, well, kids are too young to know about sexuality. That's why we shouldn't let kids be trans. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, kids are... They're not trans. I know, I was like, I said, kids are too young to know about sexuality. That's great, but what you're talking about is gender. It's, like, fully separate. But does it help non-monog does it help my bisexuality to be non-monogamous yes does it help non-monogamy to be bisexual absolutely does it make me the coolest person in the world yes definitely but like (laughs) but like it's just you know like i I, they are tied up in each other but i don't think that they are the cause of or effect of each other in just between us you say this specifically if you Mm. want to roll that sound really quick I thought I was an irredeemable monster. Yes. I thought I was the worst person in the world uh-huh. because I didn't want to be monogamous and because I I liked, uh, at the time, boys and girls. I liked all genders. The like, Gabby, like the thing that you are most, you most hate about yourself, you're going to be a fucking activist. For. Like take the thing that you are most ashamed about yourself and monetize it. <laughs> it. I think there's a lot of power in that because you're taking things that you're told to either suppress or Mm -hmm. things that will hold you back and you're using it to accelerate yourself forward. Mm -hmm. How do you take these intersections of your life and use that to uplift yourself, but also other people who live within those intersections? I mean, it's never, like, I've never had a bad reaction to telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, really, I, I, like, the whole, like, talking about having bipolar disorder only made people feel better and that's the chapter of the book that people love the most and that's the chapter that like got the most uh, affection and most like the fans were so happy about and people who read it were felt so moved by and like I I've never um it never occurred to me to be in like by the when we when I first started uh writing and being a, a public person or whatever I was always out now I'm like oh god I could have monetized the shit out of a coming out video but here we are uh, which is so cynical, but I mean, like, you could recreate it. Be like, what this if is I what just did happened. a coming out video and like now, like ten years later? <laughs> I mean, I, I ten Guys, ten I would have, watch it. I have something <laughs> to tell you. It's a huge secret, and then I just do some sort of elaborate dance about being bisexual. Um, but yeah, so like, I I felt like um, 
I, I felt like there's always people that are ashamed and then they're waiting for someone to relate to. They're waiting for someone to say the truth so that they feel okay say, being themselves and they feel okay saying the truth. I mean, the most, like I was this, so closeted and so scared. Like I remember a time in high school where it was like, I might've, like there was a, a, a thing where I was like, oh, maybe could have been outed. And I was like gonna vomit. And the idea that like that person is the same person that is like on the internet being like, buy this, buy that, you know, like uh, buy rights and like and like talking about this stuff is is so wild to me yeah. that I feel like there and that people come up to me at like meet and greets and stuff and are just like, you're how I realized I was bisexual. You're how I came out to my parents. You're how I figured this out. All this stuff like. I, I just would never have, I was so ashamed and I would have just never thought that this would have been the situation, but like it, it only benefits other people and it's only ever benefited me feeling good about myself to do. And also like with non-monogamy, I, like it said in that clip, I mean, I, I was pushing a lot of stuff down and I was like, I'm going to be a good, like fully, like I'm going to be a good wife. Like I need to, which like, what does that mean? Like in my mind, it felt very like subservient and monogamous and submissive and like, I will be a good wife. And like a lot of that has to do with religion, but like I, uh, I would have been miserable. Like I would have been like trying to hide this huge part of myself and I would have been, I mean, how would that have turned out? You know, could be very dark. So like, um, I think, and like a lot of wasted time. And so I think if like, I, if, if I, if I had had someone saying these things and I had been young and seen me, let's say, maybe I wouldn't have wasted so much time being like, I'm horrible, I'm the worst person ever, I have to get into these relationships where I need to like fix myself and like all this stuff, you know, where mm -hmm. you just are so <laughs> obsessed with fixing yourself because you're like, okay, this is wrong, this is broken, how do I have a happy life? It One big thing that I love to do to do and I think is like kind of weirdly subversive for queer people is to just be happy. Just to show yourself on social media being happy, not dead, aging. Like that's a thing that I don't think we had a luxury of, you know, I think like an entire generation was wiped out by the AIDS crisis. So like you don't see a lot of like, if you see an older gay man who's like happy, it's like, that's like revolutionary in a way that yeah. for other for other groups it might not be. Yeah, you know, I feel like a lot of times doing anything in media now, living out and mm -hmm. proud, I feel like I either am doing it performatively for myself as a teenager who mm -hmm. needed to hear it, and I'm substituting other teenagers for myself. Yes, it's like being who your 14-year-old self wanted you to be, wanted to see. Yeah. wanted to see in the world. Like I always think about when I'm writing stuff, when I'm writing fiction, when I'm when I'm writing, I try to write things that myself as a 14-year-old would have been so like um validated seeing. You know, like mm -hmm. I love I, I I try to make sure characters use the word bisexual to describe themselves. I have projects that I'm working on where like I'm very, as a polyamorous person, very over love triangles as a concept. So I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, I indulge in the Bachelor franchise and I'm always, I find it a study in straight people. And <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like watching them like Jane Goodall with the apes, like, okay. So Glasses sliding to the tip yeah, of your truly, nose, like, taking notes. So this is what they're, interesting, interesting. This is what they're up to. Um, and like, and like, I just, a lot of it is like, so polyamorous like how oh, i'm in love with two men and i have to choose and i'm always just like why why not pick both why do ads? you have to choose this seems cr like but we've just so accepted that like oh so that's what that show gets to about me it's like oh so you we've accepted that it is possible for you to be in love with two people at the same time so we we all agree that that's possible on a show that 11 million people watch and that's like straight culture but we but then the punishment is you have to choose one Get rid of the punishment. Why? There's enough space. You could probably make enough money to have a house. Oh my God, house. please. Get in some Instagram deals. Buy a huge house. All of you live together. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never thought of The Bachelor that way as, as a study into the punishment of having to choose between two people that you fall in love with. Well, my friend, my straight friend, Allison, who I wrote the book with, she wanted me to watch The Bachelor with her so badly. And then she, the way that she pitched it to me was like, it's the greatest show about polyamory. <laughs> and I was like, OK, I'll, I'll give it a try. 
And now I'm just like a gag. I just watch it to be like, ah, oh, street people. I want to go in there and like help, like be a consultant. She's helping now. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to ask about Jen, your character in the book, who's yeah. sort of a, an inflated version of you, but it's still you. Uh, somewhat. She's definitely going through, she's younger. She's mm -hmm. definitely going through a lot of stuff. So the book is is uh, a friendship between two girls, a straight girl and a queer girl. Um, and they're, they're loosely me and Allison. I mean, it's very obvious, like Ava is Allison and Jen is Gabby. And the Jen character is like pulled from stuff that I went through when I was younger. So... She goes to a very queer college. She comes out as queer. She's, like, very excited to be dating. And she has, like, a lot of fun, like, hookups. And she's, like, figuring herself out. And then in it, that's in um, I Hate Everyone But You, which was the first book. And then the second book, uh, Please Send Help, which just came out, uh, she's graduated college. So we skipped ahead four years. So she's graduated college. And, uh, and she's gotten a job in Florida, which is where I'm from. And so we played with the idea of in college, she was in like a queer paradise and she like was having the best time. And then she, her first job out of college she gets is in Florida. She moves to Florida and she can't find other queer people. And so what is it like to be without community? What is it like to be a fish out of water in, in the South? And like, how do you find community basically in like the, in rural areas in the South as a queer? So that's like what we did with Jen's storyline, which is, um, she struggles like she falls for a straight girl she like tries to, she finds out about like um the lgbtq homeless community in the area she finds out about like different home how like it's harder for them because different homeless shelters uh will turn away queer people so like she gets like a lesson in sort of what it's like to not because she'd only been in la and then at her very queer school so she gets kind of in the book a lesson in like what it's like for queer people elsewhere which i thought was important to show Absolutely, and it does it does highlight what's genuinely affecting the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community: homelessness. You can be kicked from your home, uh, you can be denied uh, mortgages because of it, you can mm -hmm. be denied jobs of it, you can lose your jobs because of mm -hmm. it. You know, and these are these are very real issues that yeah are prevalent everywhere, really. Yeah, and I wanted to to show Florida. I mean, I'm from Florida, so I wanted to like take her. We usually put the the girls in in places that we're familiar with. So mm -hmm. like Ava Allison's character is in New York City because that's where Ava, um, Allison's from. Uh, and then I was like, <clears throat> I was like, if we're gonna play with the South, uh, let's put her let's put her in Florida because that place is weird. And it's also like kind of a, a you know it's a red state. It's it's a Trump area. Like what is it like for her to work for this newspaper where her bosses are possibly Trump supporters and like so we wanted to have her be the the more fish out of water person in this book whereas like Allison's character Ava in the last book was a very uh prudish very uh OCD very like you know um introverted person uh at like a state school at USC trying to fit in with like Greek life and trying to be like a sorority girl and yeah. not succeeding so we flipped it we're like now in the second book Jen is struggling and, and Ava is like having a, a pretty good time. All right. Is there anything that you have on mind that on your mind that you want to share? Anything? Anything. We have Oh gosh. Um uh I have a, a graphic novel that comes out in um in October that is uh all mostly queer. It's about a reporter. It's not comedy. It's tr a true. Cr it's like crime drama thriller. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's from Boom Studios, who does a lot of queer comic books. Um, and uh, it's like a, a gay as hell uh, comic book. Uh, and uh, is that and, something that's new? Yeah, <laughs> and it's called Barry the Lead. And um, and uh, and I f it's uh, stars. I mean, I created it. it stars a, a a queer woman of color who's. Um, kind of has like a Hannibal Lecter relationship with this other queer woman who's in jail, and um, and it's super fun, and I'm I'm very jazzed about it. Like that's the project that I'm so excited for it to for it to come out because I just like wanted I just like I think the genre of crime and and thrillers and stuff is getting so popular, and women are often doing podcasts about it. But I wanted to like I think there's not a lot of like queer or non-white represent representation in the storytelling of it. And so I wanted to like get in there and be like, look, if we're gonna be like the, I mean, the most famous podcast about crime right now is My Favorite Murder by two women. So like, if we're gonna get into the story, like the nonfiction side of it, like let's take over the fiction side of it too. 
and j also make it gay as hell. <laughs> I mean, that's really throw glitter where you can is yeah, the mantra exactly. at this point. All right. Gabby Dunn, thank you so much for your time. Thank Again, you for this having is, me. This is In Conversation with NBC News Think and NBC Out. Thank you so much for watching. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.